Chapter Nine The Lost Leg Near the hole where Maya had set herself up for the summer lived a family of bark boring beetles. Friedelin, the father, was an earnest, industrious man who wanted many children and took immense pains to bring up a large family. He had done very well. He had fifty energetic sons to fill him with pride and high hopes. Each had dug his own meandering little tunnel in the bark of the pine tree, and all were getting on and were comfortably settled. My wife, Friedelin said to Maya, after they had known each other some time, has arranged things so that none of my sons interferes with the others. They are not even acquainted. Each goes his own way. Maya knew that human beings were none too fond of Friedelin and his people. Though she herself liked him and liked his opinions, and had found no reason to avoid him. In the morning, before the sun arose and the woods were still asleep, she could hear his fine tapping and boring. It sounded like a delicate trickling, or as if the tree were breathing in its sleep. Later she would see the thin brown dust that he had emptied out of his corridor. Once he came at an early hour, as he often did, to wish her good morning and ask if she had slept well. Not flying today? he inquired. No, it's too windy. It was windy. The wind rushed and roared and flung the branches into a mad tumult. The leaves looked ready to fly away. After each great gust, the sky would brighten, and in the pale light the trees seemed balder. The pine in which Maya and Friedelin lived shrieked with the voices of the wind as in a fury of anger and excitement. Friedelin sighed. I worked all night, he told Maya, all night. But what can you do? You've got to do something to get somewhere. And I'm not altogether satisfied with this pine. I should have tackled a fir tree. He wiped his brow and smiled in self pity. How are your children? asked Maya pleasantly. Thank you, said Friedelin. Thank you for your interest. But he hesitated. But I don't supervise the way I used to. Still, I have reason to believe they are all doing well. As he sat there, a little brown man with slightly curtailed wing sheaths and a breastplate that looked like a head too large for its body, Maya thought he was almost comical. But she knew he was a dangerous beetle who could do immense harm to the mighty trees of the forest, and if his tribe attacked a tree in numbers, then the green needles were doomed. The tree would turn sere and die. It was utterly without defenses against the little marauders who destroyed the bark and the sapwood. And the sapwood is necessary to the life of a tree because it carries the sap up to the very tips of the branches. There were stories of how whole forests had fallen victims to the race of boring beetles. Maya looked at Friedelin reflectively. She was awed into solemnity at the thought of the great power these little creatures possessed and of how important they could become. Friedelin sighed and said in a worried tone, Ah, life would be beautiful if there were no woodpeckers. Maya nodded. Yes, indeed, you're right. The woodpecker gobbles up every insect he sees. If it were only that, observed Friedelin, if it were only that he got the careless people who fool around on the outside, on the bark, I'd say very well, a woodpecker must live too. But it seems all wrong that the bird should follow us right into our corridors, into the remotest corners of our homes. But he can't. He's too big, isn't he? Friedelin looked at Maya with an air of grave importance, lifting his brow and shaking his head two or three times. It seemed to please him that he knew something she didn't know. Too big? What difference does his size make? No, my dear, it's not his size we are afraid of. It's his tongue. Maya made big eyes. Friedelin told her about the woodpecker's tongue, that it was long and thin and round as a worm and barbed and sticky. He can stretch his tongue out ten times my length, cried the bark beetle, flourishing his arm. You think, now, now, he has reached the limit. He can't make it the tiniest bit longer. But no, he goes on stretching and stretching it. 
he pokes it deep into the cracks and crevices of the bark, on the chance that he'll find somebody sitting there. He even pushes it into our passageways, actually into our corridors and chambers. Things stick to it, and that's the way he pulls us out of our homes. "'I'm not a coward,' said Maya. "'I don't think I am. But what you say makes me creepy.' "'Oh, you're all right.' said Friedelin, a little envious. You with your sting are safe. A person'll think twice before he'll let you sting his tongue. Anybody'll tell you that. But how about us bark beetles? How do you think we feel? A cousin of mine got caught. We had just had a little quarrel on account of my wife. I remember every detail perfectly. My cousin was paying us a visit and hadn't yet got used to our ways or our arrangements. All of a sudden we heard a woodpecker scratching and boring, one of the smaller species. It must have begun right at our building, because as a rule we hear him beforehand and have time to run to shelter before he reaches us. Suddenly I heard my poor cousin scream in the dark, Friedelin, I'm sticking! Then all I heard was a short, desperate scuffle, followed by complete silence, and in a few moments the woodpecker was hammering at the house next door. My poor cousin! Her name was Agatha. "'Feel how my heart is beating,' said Maya in a whisper. "'You oughtn't to have told it so quickly. My goodness, the things that do happen!' And the little bee thought of her own adventures in the past and the accidents that might still happen to her. A laugh from Friedelin interrupted her reflections. She looked up in surprise. "'See who's coming,' he cried. "'Coming up the tree!' "'Here's the fellow for you. I tell you, he's a—but you'll see.' Maya followed the direction of his gaze and saw a remarkable animal slowly climbing up the trunk. She wouldn't have believed such a creature was possible if she had not seen it with her own eyes. "'Hadn't we better hide?' she asked, alarm getting the better of astonishment. "'Absurd,' replied the bark beetle. Just sit still and be polite to the gentleman. He is very learned, really, very scholarly, and what is more, kind and modest. Like most persons of his type, rather funny. See what he's doing now. Probably thinking, observed Maya, who couldn't get over her astonishment. He's struggling against the wind, said Friedelin, and laughed. I hope his legs don't get entangled. "'Are those long threads really his legs?' asked Maya, opening her eyes wide. "'I've never seen the like.' Meanwhile, the newcomer had drawn near, and Maya got a better view of him. He looked as though he were swinging in the air. His rotund little body hung so high on his monstrously long legs, which groped for a footing on all sides like a movable scaffolding of threads. He stepped along cautiously, feeling his way, the little brown sphere of his body rose and sank, rose and sank. His legs were so very long and thin that one alone would certainly not have been enough to support his body. He needed all at once, unquestionably. As they were jointed in the middle, they rose high in the air above him. Maya clapped her hands together. "'Well,' she cried, "'did you ever! Would you have dreamed that such delicate legs—' Legs as fine as a hair could be so nimble and useful that one could really use them, and they'd know what to do. Friedelin, I think it's wonderful, simply wonderful. Ah, bah, said the bark beetle. Don't take things so seriously. Just laugh when you see something funny, that's all. But I don't feel like laughing. Often we laugh at something and later find out it was just because we haven't understood. By this time the stranger had joined them and was looking down at Maya from the height of his pointed triangles of legs. "'Good morning,' he said. "'A real windstorm, a pretty strong draft, don't you think? Or, no, you are of a different opinion?' He clung to the tree as hard as he could. Friedelin turned to hide his laughing, but little Maya replied politely that she quite agreed with him and that was why she had not gone out flying. Then she introduced herself. The stranger squinted down at her through his legs. "'Maya, of the nation of bees,' he repeated. 
delighted, really. I have heard a great deal about bees. I, myself, belong to the general family of spiders, species Daddy Longlegs, and my name is Hannibal. The word spider has an evil sound in the ears of all smaller insects, and Maya could not quite conceal her fright, especially as she was reminded of her agony in Thecla's web. Hannibal seemed to take no notice, so Maya decided, "'Well, if need be, I'll fly away, and he can whistle for me. He has no wings, and his web is somewhere else.' "'I am thinking,' said Hannibal, "'thinking very hard. If you will permit me, I will come a little closer. That big branch there makes a good shield against the wind.' "'Why, certainly,' said Maya, making room for him. Friedelin said good-bye and left. Maya stayed. She was eager to get at Hannibal's personality. "'The many, many different kinds of animals there are in the world,' she thought. "'Every day a fresh discovery.' The wind had subsided some, and the sun shone through the branches. From below rose the song of a robin redbreast, filling the woods with joy. Maya could see it perched on a branch, could see its throat swell, and pulse with the song as it held its little head raised up to the light. "'If only I could sing like that robin redbreast,' she said. "'I'd perch on a flower and keep it up the live-long day.' "'You'd produce something lovely, you would, with your humming and buzzing. "'The bird looks so happy.' "'You have great fancies,' said the daddy longlegs. "'Supposing every animal were to wish he could do something that nature had not fitted him to do, "'the world would be all topsy-turvy. "'Supposing a robin redbreast thought he had to have a sting, a sting above everything else, "'or a goat wanted to fly about gathering honey. "'Supposing a frog were to come along and languish for my kind of legs?' "'Maya laughed. "'That isn't just what I mean. I mean... It seems lovely to be able to make all beings as happy as the bird does with his song. But goodness gracious, she exclaimed suddenly, Mr. Hannibal, you have one leg too many. Hannibal frowned and looked into space, vexed. Well, you've noticed it, he said glumly. But as a matter of fact, one leg too few, not too many. "'Why? Do you usually have eight legs?' "'Permit me to explain. We spiders have eight legs. We need them all. Besides, eight is a more aristocratic number. One of my legs got lost. Too bad about it. However you manage, you make the best of it.' "'It must be dreadfully disagreeable to lose a leg,' Maya sympathized. Hannibal propped his chin on his hand and arranged his legs to keep them from being easily counted. "'I'll tell you how it happened. Of course, as usual, when there's mischief, a human being is mixed up in it. We spiders are careful, and look what we're doing, but human beings are careless. They grab you sometimes as though you were a piece of wood. Shall I tell you?' "'Oh, yes, please,' said Maya, settling herself comfortably. It would be awfully interesting. You must certainly have gone through a great deal. I should say so, said Hannibal. Now listen. We daddy longlegs, you know, hunt by night. I was then living in a green garden house. It was overgrown with ivy, and there were a number of broken window panes, which made it very convenient for me to crawl in and out. The man came at dark. In one hand he carried his artificial sun, which he calls lamp. In the other hand a small bottle, under his arm some paper, and in his pocket another bottle. He put everything down on the table and began to think, because he wanted to write his thoughts on the paper. You must certainly have come across paper in the woods or in the garden. The black on the paper is what man has excogitated, excogitated. Marvelous! cried Maya, all aglow that she was to learn so much. For this purpose, Hannibal continued, man needs both bottles. He inserts a stick into the one and drinks out of the other. 
The more he drinks, the better it goes. Of course, it is about us insects that he writes. Everything he knows about us, and he writes strenuously, but the result is not much to boast of, because up to now man has found out very little in regard to insects. He is absolutely ignorant of our soul life, and hasn't the least consideration of our feelings. You will see. Don't you think well of human beings? asked Maya. Oh, yes, yes. But the loss of a leg, the daddy long legs looked down slantwise, is apt to embitter one, rather. I see, said Maya. One evening I was sitting on a window frame as usual, prepared for the chase. And the man was sitting at the table, his two bottles before him, trying to produce something. It annoyed me dreadfully that a whole swarm of little flies and gnats, upon which I depend for my sustenance, had settled upon the artificial sun, and were staring into it in that crude, stupid, uneducated way of theirs. "'Well,' observed Maya, "'I think I'd look at a thing like that myself.' "'Look, for all I care. But to look and to stare like an idiot are two extremely different things.' Just watch once and see the silly jig they dance around a lamp. It's nothing for them to butt their heads about twenty times. Some of them keep it up until they burn their wings, and all the time they stare and stare at the light. Poor creatures! Evidently they lose their wits. Then they had better stay outside on the window frame or under the leaves. They're safe from the lamp there, and that's where I can catch them. Well, on that fateful night, I saw from my position on the window frame that some gnats were lying scattered on the table beside the lamp, drawing their last breath. The man did not seem to notice or care about them, so I decided to go and take them myself. That's perfectly natural, isn't it? Perfectly. And yet it was my undoing. I crept up the leg of the table very softly on my guard until I could peep over the edge. The man seemed dreadfully big. I watched him working, then slowly, very slowly, carefully lifting one leg at a time, I crossed over to the lamp. As long as I was covered by the bottle, all went well, but I had scarcely turned the corner when the man looked up and grabbed me. He lifted me up by one of my legs, dangled me in front of his huge eyes, and said, "'See what's here! Just see what's here!' And he grinned, the brute! He grinned with his whole face, as though it were a laughing matter. Hannibal sighed, and little Maya kept quite still. Her head was in a whirl. "'Have human beings such immense eyes?' she asked at last. "'Please think of me in the position I was in,' cried Hannibal, vexed. "'Try to imagine how I felt.' Who'd like to be hanging by the leg in front of eyes twenty times as big as his own body, and a mouth full of gleaming teeth, each fully twice as big as himself? Well, what do you think? Awful, perfectly awful. Thank the Lord my leg broke off. There's no telling what might have happened if my leg had not broken off. I fell to the table, and then I ran. I ran as fast as my remaining legs would take me, and hid behind the bottle. There I stood, and hurled threats of violence at the man. They saved me, my threats did. The man was afraid to run after me. I saw him lay my leg on the white paper, and I watched how it wanted to escape, which it can't do without me. Was it still moving? asked Maya, prickling at the thought. Yes, our legs always do move when they're pulled out. My leg ran, but I not being there it didn't know where to run to, so it merely flopped about aimlessly on the same spot, and the man watched it, clutching at his nose and smiling, smiling, the heartless wretch, at my leg's sense of duty. Impossible, said the little bee, quite scared. An often leg can't crawl. An often leg? What is an often leg? A leg that has come off, 
explained Maya, staring at him. Don't you know? At home we children used the word often for anything that had come off. You should drop your nursery slang when you're out in the world and in the presence of cultured people, said Hannibal severely. But it is true that our legs totter along after they have been torn from our bodies. I can't believe it without proof. Do you think I'll tear one of my legs off to satisfy you? Hannibal's tone was ugly. I see you're not a fit person to associate with. Nobody, I'd like you to know, nobody has ever doubted my word before. Maya was terribly put out. She couldn't understand what had upset the daddy long legs so, or what dreadful thing she had done. It isn't altogether easy to get along with strangers, she thought. They don't think the way we do, and don't see that we mean no harm. She was depressed and cast a troubled look at the spider with his long legs and soured expression. Really, someone ought to come and eat you up. Hannibal had evidently mistaken Maya's good nature for weakness, for now something unusual happened to the little bee. Suddenly her depression passed and gave way, not to alarm or timidity, but to a calm courage. She straightened up, lifted her lovely transparent wings, uttered her high, clear buzz, and said with a gleam in her voice, "'I'm a bee, Mr. Hannibal.' "'I beg your pardon,' said he, and without saying good-bye, turned and ran down the tree-trunk, as fast as a person can run who has seven legs. Maya had to laugh willy-nilly. From down below, Hannibal began to scold. "'You're bad. You threaten helpless people.' You threaten them with your sting when you know they're handicapped by a misfortune and can't get away fast. But your hour is coming, and when you're in a tight place, you'll think of me and be sorry. Hannibal disappeared under the leaves of the colt's foot on the ground. His last words had not reached the little bee. The wind had almost died away, and the day promised to be fine. White clouds sailed aloft in a deep, deep blue, looking happy and serene like good thoughts of the Lord. Maya was cheered. She thought of the rich shaded meadows by the woods, and of the sunny slopes beyond the lake. A blithe activity must have begun there by this time. In her mind she saw the slim grasses waving, and the purple iris that grew in the rills at the edge of the woods. From the flower of an iris she could look across to the mysterious night of the pine forest, and catch its cool breath of melancholy. She knew that its forbidding silence, which transformed the sunshine into a reddish half-light of sleep, was the home of the fairy tale. Maya was already flying. She had started off instinctively, in answer to the call of the meadows and their gay carpeting of flowers. It was a joy to be alive. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 the wonders of the night. Thus the days and weeks of her young life passed for little Maya among the insects in a lovely summer world. A happy roving in garden and meadow, occasional risks and many joys. For all that, she often missed the companions of her early childhood, and now and again suffered a pang of homesickness, an ache of longing for her people in the kingdom she had left. There were hours, too, when she yearned for regular useful work and association with friends of her own kind. However, at bottom she had a restless nature, little Maya had, and was scarcely ready to settle down for good and live in the community of the bees. She wouldn't have felt comfortable. Often, among animals as well as human beings, there are some who cannot conform to the ways of the others. Before we condemn them, we must be careful and give them a chance to prove themselves. For it is not always laziness or stubbornness that makes them different. Far from it. At the back of their peculiar urge is a deep longing for something higher or better than what everyday life has to offer. And many a time young runaways have grown up into good, sensible, experienced men and women. 
little maya was a pure sensitive soul and her attitude to the big beautiful world came of a genuine eagerness for knowledge and a great delight in the glories of creation yet it is hard to be alone even when you are happy and the more maya went through the greater became her yearning for companionship and love she was no longer so very young she had grown into a strong superb creature with sound bright wings a sharp dangerous sting and a highly developed sense of both the pleasures and the hazards of her life through her own experience she had gathered information and stored up wisdom which she now often wished she could apply to something of real value there were days when she was ready to return to the hive and throw herself at the queen's feet and sue for pardon and honorable reinstatement but a great burning desire held her back the desire to know human beings she had heard so many contradictory things about them that she was confused rather than enlightened yet she had a feeling that in the whole of creation there were no beings more powerful or more intelligent or more sublime than they a few times in her wanderings she had seen people but only from afar from high up in the air big and little people black people white people red people and such as dressed in many colors she had never ventured close once she had caught the glimmer of red near a brook and thinking it was a bed of flowers had flown down she found a human being fast asleep among the brookside blossoms it had golden hair and a pink face and wore a red dress it was dreadfully large of course but still it looked so good and sweet that maya thrilled and tears came to her eyes she lost all sense of her whereabouts she could do nothing but gaze and gaze upon the slumbering presence all the horrid things she had ever heard against man seemed utterly impossible lies they must have been mean lies that she had been told against creatures as charming as this one asleep in the shade of the whispering birch trees after a while a mosquito came and buzzed greetings look cried maya hot with excitement and delight look just look at that human being there how good how beautiful doesn't it fill you with enthusiasm the mosquito gave maya a surprised stare then turned slowly round to glance at the object of her admiration yes it is good i just tasted it i stung it look my body is shining red with its blood maya had to press her hand to her heart so startled was she by the mosquito's daring will it die she cried where did you wound it how could you how could you screw up your courage to sting it and how vile why you're a beast of prey the mosquito tittered why it's only a very little human being it answered in its high thin voice it's the size called girl the size at which the legs are covered halfway up with a separate colored casing my sting of course goes through the casing but usually doesn't reach the skin your ignorance is really stupendous do you actually think that human beings are good i haven't come across one who willingly let me take the tiniest drop of his blood i don't know very much about human beings i admit said maya humbly but of all the insects you bees have most to do with human beings that's a well-known fact i left our kingdom maya confessed timidly i didn't like it i wanted to learn about the outside world well well what do you think of that the mosquito drew a step nearer how do you like your freelancing i must say i admire you for your independence i for one would never consent to serve human beings but they serve us too said maya who couldn't bear a slight to be put upon her people maybe to what nation do you belong 
I come of the nation in the castle park. The ruling queen is Helen the Eighth. Indeed, said the mosquito, and bowed low. An enviable lineage. My deepest respects. There was a revolution in your kingdom not so long ago, wasn't there? I heard it from the messengers of the rebel swarm. Am I right? Yes, said Maya, proud and happy that her nation was so respected and renowned. Homesickness for her people awoke again, deep down in her heart, and she wished she could do something good and great for her queen and country. Carried away on the wings of this dream, she forgot to ask about human beings. Or, like as not, she refrained from questions, feeling that the mosquito would not tell her things she would be glad to hear. The might of a creature impressed her as a saucy miss, and people of her kind usually had nothing good to say of others. Besides, she soon flew away. "'I'm going to take one more drink,' she called back to Maya. "'Later I and my friends are going flying in the light of the westering sun. Then we'll be sure to have good weather tomorrow.' Maya made off quickly. She couldn't bear to stay and see the mosquito hurt the sleeping child. And how could she do this thing and not perish? Hadn't Cassandra said, If you sting a human being, you will die? Maya still remembered every detail of this incident with the child and the mosquito, but her craving to know human beings well had not been stilled. She made up her mind to be bolder and never stop trying until she had reached her goal. At last, Maya's longing to know human beings was to be satisfied, and in a way far, far lovelier and more wonderful than she had dreamed. Once, on a warm evening, having gone to sleep earlier than usual, she woke up suddenly in the middle of the night, something that had never happened to her before. When she opened her eyes, her astonishment was indescribable. Her little bedroom was all steeped in a quiet, bluish radiance. It came down through the entrance, and the entrance itself shone as if hung with a silver-blue curtain. Maya did not dare to budge at first, though not because she was frightened. No. Somehow, along with the light came a rare, lovely peacefulness, and outside her room the air was filled with a sound finer, more harmonious than any music she had ever heard. After a time she rose timidly, awed by the glamour and the strangeness of it all, and looked out. The whole world seemed to lie under the spell of an enchantment. Everything was sparkling and glittering in pure silver. The trunks of the birch trees, the slumbering leaves, were overlaid with silver. The grass, which from her height seemed to lie under delicate veils, was set with a thousand pale pearls. All things near and far, the silent distances, were shrouded in this soft, bluish sheen. "'This must be the night,' Maya whispered and folded her hands. High up in the heavens, partly veiled by the leaves of a birch tree, hung a full, clear disk of silver, from which the radiance poured down that beautified the world. And then Maya saw countless bright, sharp little lights surrounding the moon in the heavens. Oh, so still and beautiful, unlike any shining things she had ever seen before. To think, she beheld the night, the moon and the stars, the wonders, the lovely wonders of the night. She had heard of them, but never believed in them. It was almost too much. Then the sound rose again, the strange night sound that must have awakened her. It came from nearby, filling the welkin, a soaring chirp with a silvery ring that matched the silver on the trees and leaves and grass, and seemed to come rilling down from the moon on the beams of silver light. Maya looked about for the source in vain. In the mysterious drift of light and shadow it was difficult to make out objects in clear outline. Everything was draped so mysteriously, and yet everything showed up true and in such heroic beauty. Her room could keep her no longer. 
out she had to fly into this new splendor, the night splendor. The good Lord will take care of me, she thought. I am not bent upon wrong. As she was about to fly off through the silver light to her favorite meadow, now lying full under the moon, she saw a winged creature alight on a birch tree leaf not far away. Scarcely alighted, it raised its head to the moon, lifted its narrow wings, and drew the edge of one against the other, for all the world as though it were playing on a violin. And sure enough, the sound came, the silvery chirp that filled the whole moonlit world with melody. "'Exquisite!' whispered Maya. "'Heavenly, heavenly, heavenly!' She flew over to the leaf. The night was so mild and warm that she did not notice it was cooler than by day. When she touched the leaf, the chirper broke off playing abruptly. And to Maya, it seemed as if there had never been such a stillness before, so profound was the hush that followed. It was uncanny. Through the dark leaves filtered the light, white and cool. "'Good night,' said Maya politely, thinking good night was the greeting for the night, like good morning for the morning. "'Please excuse me for interrupting, but the music you make is so fascinating that I had to find out where it came from.' The chirper stared at Maya wide-eyed. "'What sort of a crawling creature are you?' it asked after some moments had passed. I have never met one like you before. I am not a crawling insect. I am Maya of the nation of bees. Oh, of the nation of bees, indeed. You live by day, don't you? I have heard of your race from the hedgehog. He told me that in the evening he eats the dead bodies that are thrown out of your hive. Yes, said Maya, with a faint chill of apprehension. That's so. Cassandra told me about him. She heard of him from the sentinels. He comes when twilight falls and snouts in the grass looking for dead bodies. But do you associate with the hedgehog? Why, he's an awful brute. I don't think so. We tree crickets get along with him splendidly. We call him uncle. Of course, he always tries to catch us. But he never succeeds, so we have great fun teasing him. Everybody has to live, doesn't he? Just so he doesn't live off me, what do I care? Maya shook her head. She didn't agree. But not caring to insult the cricket by contradicting, she changed the subject. So you're a tree cricket? Yes, a snowy tree cricket. "'But I must play, so please don't keep me any longer. "'It's full moon, a wonderful night. "'I must play.' "'Oh, do make an exception this once. "'You play all the time. "'Tell me about the night.' "'A midsummer night is the loveliest in the world,' "'answered the cricket. "'It fills the heart with rapture. "'But what my music doesn't tell you "'I shan't be able to explain.' Why need everything be explained? Why know everything? We poor creatures can find out only the tiniest bit about existence, yet we can feel the glory of the whole wide world. And the cricket set up its happy silvery strumming. Heard from close by where Maya sat, the music was overpowering in its loudness. The little bee sat quite still in the blue summer night, listening and musing deeply about life and creation. Silence fell. There was a faint whirr, and Maya saw the cricket fly out into the moonlight. The night makes one feel sad, she reflected. Her flowery meadow drew her now. She flew off. At the edge of the brook stood the tall irises brokenly reflected in the running water. A glorious sight. The moonlight was whirled along in the braided current. The wavelets winked and whispered. The irises seemed to lean over asleep. 
asleep from sheer delight, thought the little bee. She dropped down on a blue petal in the full light of the moon, and could not take her eyes from the living waters of the brook, the quivering flash, the flashing come and go of countless sparks. On the bank opposite, the birch trees glittered as if hung with the stars. Where is all that water flowing to? she wondered. The cricket is right. We know so little about the world. Of a sudden, a fine little voice rose in song from the flower of an iris close beside her, ringing like a pure, clear bell, different from any earthly sound that Maya knew. Her heart throbbed. She held her breath. Oh, what is going to happen? What am I going to see now? The iris swayed gently. One of the petals curved in at the edge, and Maya saw a tiny snow-white human hand holding on to the flower's rim with its wee little fingers. Then a small blonde head arose, and then a delicate luminous body in white garments. A human being in miniature was coming out of the iris. Words cannot tell Maya's awe and rapture. She sat rigid. The tiny being climbed to the edge of the blossom, lifted its arms up to the moonlight, and looked out into the bright shining night with a smile of bliss lighting up its face. Then a faint quiver shook its luminous body, and from its shoulders two wings unfolded whiter than the moonlight, pure as snow, rising above its blonde head and reaching down to its feet. How lovely it was! How exquisitely lovely! Nothing that Maya had ever seen compared with it in loveliness. Standing there in the moonlight, holding its hands up to heaven, the luminous little being lifted its voice again and sang. The song rang out in the night, and Maya understood the words. My home is light, the crystal bowl, of heaven's blue, I love it so. Both death and life will change, I know, but not my soul, my living soul. My soul is that which breathes anew from all of loveliness and grace, and as it flows from God's own face, it flows from his creations too. Maya burst into sobs. What it was that made her so sad, and yet so happy, she could not have told. The little human being turned around. "'Who is crying?' he asked in his chiming voice. "'It's only me,' stammered Maya. "'Excuse me for interrupting you. But why are you crying?' "'I don't know. Perhaps just because you are so beautiful.' Who are you? Oh, do tell me if I am not asking too much. You are an angel, aren't you? You must be. Oh, no, said the little creature, quite serious. I am only a sprite, a flower sprite. But, dear little bee, what are you doing out here in the meadow so late at night? The sprite flew over to a curving iris blade beside Maya, and regarded her long and kindly from his swaying perch in the moonlight. Maya told him all about herself, what she had done, what she knew, and what she longed for. And while she spoke, his eyes never left her, those large, dark eyes glowing in the white fairy face under the golden hair that ever and anon shone like silver in the moonlight. When she finished, he stroked her head, and looked at her so warmly and lovingly that the little bee, beside herself with joy, had to lower her gaze. "'We sprites,' he explained, "'live seven nights, but we must stay in the flower in which we are born, else we die at dawn.' Maya opened her eyes wide in terror. "'Then hurry, hurry, fly back into your flower!' The sprite shook his head sadly. Too late. 
But listen, I have more to tell you. Most of us sprites are glad to leave our flowers never to return, because a great happiness is connected with our leaving. We are endowed with a remarkable power. Before we die, we can fulfill the dearest wish of the first creature we meet. It is when we make up our minds seriously to leave the flower for the purpose of making someone happy that our wings grow. How wonderful! cried Maya. I'd leave the flower too, then. It must be lovely to fulfill another person's wish. That she was the first being whom the sprite on his flight from the flower had met did not occur to her. And then must you die? The sprite nodded, but not sadly this time. We live to see the dawn still, he said. But when the dew falls, we are drawn into the fine cobwebby veils that float above the grass and the flowers of the meadows. Haven't you often noticed that the veils shine white as though a light were inside them? It's the sprites, their wings and their garments. When the light rises, we change into dewdrops. The plants drink us, and we become a part of their growing and blooming, until in time we rise again as sprites from out their flowers. Then you were once another sprite? asked Maya, tense, breathless with interest. The earnest eyes said yes. But I have forgotten my earlier existence. We forget everything in our flower sleep. Oh, what a lovely fate! It is the same as that of all earthly creatures, when you really come to think of it, even if it isn't always flowers out of which they wake from their sleep of death. But we won't talk of that tonight. Oh, I'm so happy, cried Maya. Then you haven't got a wish? You're the first person I've met, you know, and I possess the power to grant your dearest wish. I? But I'm only a bee. No, it's too much. It would be too great a joy. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve that you should be so good to me. No one deserves the good and the beautiful. The good and the beautiful come to us like the sunshine. Maya's heart beat stormily. Oh, she did have a wish, a burning wish, but she didn't dare confess it. The elf seemed to guess. He smiled, so you couldn't keep anything a secret from him. Well, he stroked his golden hair off his pure forehead. I'd like to know human beings at their best and most beautiful, said the little bee. She spoke quickly and hotly. She was afraid she would be told that so great a wish could not be granted. But the sprite drew himself up. His expression was serious and serene. His eyes shone with confidence. He took Maya's trembling hand and said, Come, we'll fly together. Your wish shall be granted. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven with the Sprite, and so Maya and the flower sprite started off together in the bright midsummer night, flying low over the blossomy meadow, his white reflection crossing the brook shone as though a star were gliding through the water. How happy the little bee was to confide herself to this gracious being, whatever he were to do. Wherever he were to lead her would be good and right, she felt. She would have liked to ask him a thousand questions had she dared. As they were passing between a double row of high poplar trees, something whirred above them. A dark moth, as big and strong as a bird, crossed their way. One moment, wait one moment, please, the sprite called. Maya was surprised to see how readily the moth responded. All three alighted on a high poplar branch, from which there was a far view out upon the tranquil moonlit landscape. The quaking leaves whispered delicately. 
the moth, perching directly opposite Maya, in the full light of the moon, slowly lifted his spread wings and dropped them again softly, as if gently fanning, fanning a cool breath upon someone. Broad diagonal stripes of a gorgeous bright blue marked his wings. His black head was covered as with dark velvet. His face was like a strangely mysterious mask, out of which glowed a pair of dark eyes. How wonderful were the creatures of the night! A little cold shiver ran through Maya. She felt she was dreaming the strangest dream of her life. "'You are beautiful,' she said to the moth. "'Beautiful, really!' She was awed and solemn. "'Who is your companion?' the moth asked the sprite. "'A bee. I met her just as I was leaving my flower.' The moth seemed to realize what that meant. He looked at Maya almost enviously. "'You fortunate creature!' "'Are you sad?' asked Maya, out of the warmth of her heart. The moth shook his head. "'No, not sad.' His voice sounded friendly and grateful, and he gave Maya such a kind look that she would have liked to strike up a friendship with him then and there." "'Is the bat still abroad, or has he gone to rest?' This was the question for which the sprite had stopped the moth. "'Oh, he's gone to rest long ago. You want to know, do you, on account of your companion?' The sprite nodded. Maya was dying to find out what a bat was, but the sprite seemed to be in a hurry. With a charming gesture of restlessness, he tossed his shining hair back from his forehead. "'Come, Maya,' he said. "'We must hurry. The night is so short.' "'Shall I carry you part of the way?' asked the moth. The sprite thanked him, but declined. "'Some other time,' he called. "'Then it will be never,' thought Maya, as they flew away. "'Because at dawn the flower sprite must die.' The moth remained on the leaf, looking after them, until the glimmer of the fairy garments grew smaller and smaller, and finally sank into the depths of the blue distance. Then he turned his face slowly, and surveyed his great dark wings with their broad blue stripes. He sank into a reverie. "'So often I have heard that I am grey and ugly,' he said to himself, "'and that my dress is not to be compared with the superb robes of the butterfly. But the little bee saw only what is beautiful in me, and she asked me if I was sad. I wonder whether I am or not. No, I am not sad, he decided. Not now. Meanwhile, Maya and the flower sprite flew through the dense shrubbery of a garden. The glory of it in the dimmed moonlight was beyond the power of the mortal lips to say. An intoxicatingly sweet cool breath of dew and slumbering flowers transformed all things into unutterable blessings. The lilac grapes of the acacias sparkled in freshness. The June rose-tree looked like a small blooming heaven hung with red lamps. The white stars of the jasmine glowed palely, sadly, and poured out their perfume as if, in this one hour, to make a gift of their all. Maya was dazed. She pressed the sprite's hand and looked at him. A light of bliss shone from his eyes. "'Who could have dreamed of this?' whispered the little bee. Just then she saw something that sent a pang through her. Oh, she cried, look, a star has fallen. It's straying about and can't find its way back to its place in the sky. That's a firefly, said the flower sprite without a smile. Now in the midst of her amazement, Maya realized for the first time why the sprite seemed so dear and kind. He never laughed at her ignorance, 
On the contrary, he helped her when she went wrong. "'They are odd little creatures,' the sprite continued. "'They carry their own light about with them on warm summer nights "'and enliven the dark under the shrubbery where the moonlight doesn't shine through. "'So Firefly can keep tryst with Firefly even in the dark. "'Later, when we come to the human beings, you will make the acquaintance of one of them.' "'Why?' asked Maya. "'You'll soon see.' By this time they had reached an arbor completely overgrown with jasmine and woodbine. They descended almost to the ground. From close by, within the arbor, came the sound of faint whisperings. The flower sprite beckoned to a firefly. "'Would you be good enough,' he asked, "'to give us a little light?' We have to push through these dark leaves here. We want to get to the inside of the jasmine arbor. But your glow is much brighter than mine. I think so, too, put in Maya, more to hide her excitement than anything else. I must wrap myself up in a leaf, explained the sprite, else the human beings would see me and be frightened. We sprites appear to human beings only in their dreams. "'I see,' said the firefly. "'I am at your service. I will do what I can. Won't the great beast with you hurt me?' The sprite shook his head no, and the firefly believed him. The sprite now took a leaf and wrapped himself in it. The gleam of his white garments was completely hidden. Then he picked a little bluebell from the grass and put it on his shining head like a helmet. The only bit of him left exposed was his face, which was so small that surely no one would notice it. He asked the firefly to perch on his shoulder, and with its wings to dim its lamp on the one side so as to keep the dazzle out of his eyes. "'Come now,' he said, taking Maya's hand. "'We had better climb up right here.' The little bee was thinking of something the sprite had said, as they clambered up the vine, she asked, "'Do human beings dream when they sleep?' "'Not only then. They dream sometimes even when they are awake. They sit with their bodies a little limp, their heads bent a little forward, and their eyes searching the distance, as if to see into the very heavens. Their dreams are always lovelier than life. That's why we appear to them in their dreams.' The sprite now laid his tiny finger on his lips, bent aside a small blooming sprig of jasmine, and gently pushed Maya ahead. "'Look down,' he said softly. "'You'll see what you have been wishing to see.' The little bee looked and saw two human beings sitting on a bench in the shadows cast by the moonlight, a boy and a girl, and the girl with her head leaning on the boy's shoulder, and the boy holding his arm around the girl as if to protect her. They sat in complete stillness, looking wide-eyed into the night. It was as quiet as if they had both gone to sleep. Only from a distance came the chirping of the crickets, and slowly, slowly, the moonlight drifted through the leaves. Maya, transported out of herself, gazed into the girl's face. Although it looked pale and wistful, it seemed to be transfused by the hidden radiance of a great happiness. Above her large eyes lay golden hair, like the golden hair of the sprite, and upon it rested the heavenly sheen of the midsummer night. From her red lips, slightly parted, came a breath of rapture and melancholy, as if she wanted to offer everything that was hers to the man by her side for his happiness. And now she turned to him, pulled his head down, and whispered a magical something that brought a smile to his face, such as Maya thought no earthly being could wear. In his eyes gleamed a happiness and a vigor, as if the whole big world were his to own, and suffering and misfortune were banished forever from the face of the earth. Maya somehow had no desire to know what he said to the girl in reply. Her heart quivered as though the ecstasy that emanated from the two human beings 
was also hers. "'Now I have seen the most glorious thing that my eyes will ever behold,' she whispered to herself. "'I know now that human beings are most beautiful when they are in love.' How long Maya stayed behind the leaves without stirring, lost in looking at the boy and girl, she did not know. When she turned round, the firefly's lamp had been extinguished. The sprite was gone." Through the doorway of the arbor, far across the country, on the distant horizon, showed a narrow streak of red. End of chapter 11